Hey, shalom everyone and welcome to the second tasting of the Technion webinar series, a series of three short webinars about food technology. Each webinar will be up to 30 minutes, including the Q&A, in order to help you better digest the talk. My name is Yoash Dreer and I'm the CEO of Technion Australia. If you don't know who we are, Technion Australia is the local society of Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, and we are here to support Technion's activities and in research. And well, to, and uh, as well, we're running our own, some local programs. Tonight, we have a great speaker, Associate Professor Ori Lesmes from the Faculty of Biotechno Biotechnology and Food Engineering at the Technion. Professor Lesmes is married to Sabrina, the proud father of three children, and a scientist dedicated to a responsible development of healthier food and oil formulations. Uri uh, joined Technion in 2010 after holding appointment as lecturer at, at the postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Food Science at the University of Massachusetts. He gained his degrees from the Technion, his the BSc in cum laude in 2004, and his PhD in 2008. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box and Professor Lesmes will address them at the end. Um, Uri, the stage is yours. You are muted. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot, uh, Yoash. Uh, first, for drawing my, my attention to the fact that I'm muted. And second, for inviting me to go all the way to Australia uh, from my seat. Uh, it's a nice uh, experience, thanks to technology. And that, that's going to be also part of, uh, uh, of the thought that's going to uh, underlie this, uh, this talk today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, one of the, the, the things that worries me and concerns me a lot, and that is uh, what's going to be the future for our food? What uh, are my, my kids going to eat? And uh, is that going to be healthier for them or unhealthy? Uh, and that's basically a part of the driving force because food is, is here. Uh, we know food, we see it, we know to identify food, but uh, uh, how is that intersecting our health and how is that impacting modern life today? And how will it um, impact our world tomorrow? That is a big question that is still ongoing. Because if we look back into history, uh, we are a very unique species. Uh, we are primates, that's very nice. Uh, but we are the very unique primates that uh, try to run uh, this earth. And uh, our biggest leap as primates actually occurred uh, about 70,000 years ago. Uh, the best evidence is actually not far away from me here in Haifa, the discovery of fire and uh, our ability to cook foods. If you really drill down to it, what makes us very, very unique and unlike any other species is that we are the only species that eats cooked food. Think about it, communication. We, all, most of the things that we do as humans is not very, very unique to us as animals. Whether we live in societies, whether we communicate, other species can do it as well. But we are the only ones that cook and live of cooked food. We have actually evolved in the past 70,000 years to live off cooked food. So where are we now? We are in the 21st century. And the 21st century offers us a spectrum of modern food challenges. We've evolved to eat cooked food. We live off cooked food. And if we look back a very short while back into history, 200 years ago, half of humanity was involved in the food ecosystem, meaning from agriculture to, uh, to the distribution of food or the serving of food. Half of the population. Today, it's only 4 to 7% which means that about roughly 40% of the human population was released from being occupied with food and being concerned over food. And now we can do other things. And think about it, the last 200 years, we developed computers, we went to space, we did a lot of things because people like Steve Jobs and, and the people at NASA didn't have to worry where their coffee would come from or where their next meal would come from because those four and 7% actually took care of it. And today we're facing a lot of challenges in that respect because the human population keeps growing. We're, we're already past the 8 billion mark last year. We're facing the 9 billion mark 
uh, by 2030 or 2035, depends on who you ask. And and food is, is a major concern because it's part of our existence. It's actually wired into our limbic system. We know, we realize it's in, it's part of our existence. And this is why we, we respond to foods very emotionally. But it's not just about emotions, it's about taste, it's about making foods affordable for everyone, it's about ensuring that food is safe, it's accessible, it's convenient. You don't have to really, if you want to eat a, a piece of schnitzel, you don't have to kill the chicken and, and, and skin it uh, or, uh, or skin an animal or, or even go to, the, to harvest your own wheat for, for order, in order for you to eat bread. So it's also about convenience and it's about diversity. And why am I concerned? Because the future is coming and the future is coming at a really fast pace. Uh, thanks to technology and, and, and human, uh, and human in inventiveness, uh, we've been cooking up new foods. And you see in the screens in front of you a giant meatball. Uh, this is a, a headline from CBS News, a real headline dating March 28th, 2023. So roughly six months ago, a startup in Europe actually uh, hybridized DNA from mammoth with that of an elephant in order to generate a lab-grown meat that was used to generate this meatball. So I'm concerned with a simple question, and that is if any cell can be grown and made into an artificial or, or a cultured meat, and we can now try to master, to use technology to master our environment and to produce our own foods, what are we going to produce next? Are we really capable enough to design, to rationally design our future foods? Because think about it, if, if a mammoth that doesn't even exist could be brought up from the grave and made into a piece of meat that people can actually feel, smell, and taste, why shouldn't we eat ourselves even? That would be the most sustainable thing. Take umbilical cord or stem cells of humans, grow them in the lab, and people will eat themselves up. So besides the ethical questions it raises, it also raises a lot of environmental and nutritional in, uh, questions, whether that will be healthy for us. So what I would like to, tell, to, to talk to you about is to give you examples, a few examples of how all of these future innovations have a lot of different faces, just like the movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what I would like to talk to you is about the good side of things, how we can harness science and technology to produce foods that are better for us. I'll give you an example of how we can sometimes try to do good but end up doing bad because we didn't realize. Uh, and we'll talk about the risks of some food additives. And we'll also talk about the ugly side of things. And that is foods that we right now are taboo, like insects, and how they could help us reshape our health or uh, even design our new microbiomes in our gut and have a better gut feeling towards food. So let's start off with a good story. Let's take protein, for example. Protein is very important for us. It's a major part of our, of our diet. It's, it's a huge part of, of excuse me, of, uh, of what we eat and what builds our muscles. So we need to get protein. So a lot of different sources of protein and, and, and et cetera. So, uh, so that, that is uh, something for a given. But can we harness proteins to deliver something other? Can we functionalize foods to deliver what we call extra nutritional values? For example, capsaicin. Capsaicin is an active bioact is a bioactive ingredient find it found in chili peppers. It's that spicy or that pungent uh, antioxidant ingredient in those chili peppers. The problem is every not everybody likes spicy food, but this capsaicin is also very good for us. 
especially if we're trying, for example, to alleviate inflammatory processes, especially if we're talking about, for example, inflammatory diseases of the gut. So eating spicy foods could be bad for people with Crohn's and colitis, but if they consume capsaicin, that could actually sometimes even alleviate some of their symptoms. So how can we try to deliver something to people and make it fly under the radar? For this, we adapted, a, a, in this project that I'm talking about, we adapted a, a delivery system. Particles made out of proteins, just like delivery systems for drugs. So we created different architectures out of proteins. And you can see it here on, on, on the left side of the screens, nanoparticles and, and nanofibrils. So fibers that are nanometric in size that actually entrap in them the capsaicin and they control the, it, its release only in the digestive tract. Meaning that once we take it into our mouth, we don't feel the pungency, but this active compound is released in the gastrointestinal tract where it can either act or be absorbed to act somewhere else in our body. So we can actually infuse, if you'd like, foods with higher values through rational design, through adapting concepts from the pharmacological side of, of humanity. And this also brings me to a, a, another question and that is, does it really matter who is eating the food? Because as food engineers, we've been taught over the past century to focus mostly on generating high quality products, good foods, foods that are efficient in many senses. So in terms of shelf life, in terms of palatability, that they are tasty to the consumer, that they are valued, but food doesn't really have a purpose unless it's eaten. So some of the questions that we ask in my, uh, in my research team is, does it really make a difference who is eating this food? So one of my students asked this simple question that you see in front of you, and that is, does sex matter? Is it really a difference between Adam and Eve eating the apple? Would that apple do different things in their body? The intuitive question, the intuitive answer, sorry, would probably be yes, because we're different. There's no other way of saying it. So we actually went on to research this question. We created an in vitro digestive system, which means that these are is a series of bioreactors that simulate the digestive conditions of a male or a female. And we fed them, for example, with whey proteins or milk proteins, if you'd like, asking the simple question of if a male and a female, the same age, the same health condition, pretty much, the only thing distinguishing them is being male or female, they drink the same glass of milk. Will they get the same values out of this glass of milk? The answer was quite surprising to us, and that is, no, there are subtle differences very subtle differences. So what you see here in these graphs and, and these 3D images of the proteins are subtle differences in how different proteins are digested differentially in males and females. What was really surprising to us is that, for example, this highlighted red ribbon, which is part of a protein found in quay, or this red ribbon here, that is a part of a different protein, in way, actually in code for the release of agents called peptides. So these parts, when they are degraded in our digestive system, they are degraded into peptides and these peptides actually affect our satiety and satiation. And if you look closely into the graphs, you will see that the pink and blue lines are not aligned, meaning that males and females do not release these bioactive peptides at the same level. So from the same proteins, we might get different sensations of satiety and satiation. This was just recently published because this is a, an open question of whether we would feel the same degree of fullness from the same glass of milk, being males or females, because this actually has repercussions to how we can try to design future foods 
to have better impact on satiety and satiation and try to tackle obesity before it becomes obesity and try to help people control their caloric intake over the day. So that's part one of the story. Let's try to go to part two, the benefits and risks of food additives, because people know what they like and people like certain textures, people like certain palatable foods, their shakes, etc. But as industry, they struggle constantly to produce the same product. So if you buy in the supermarket a specific shake, you want to know that this shake will be the same if you buy it next month or down the year. So food additives help us. They help us help us have a constant type of products. They help us also generate products with longer shelf life, which means that we consume or we waste less food and we consume foods for longer times, which means that we are more sustainable in that sense. So food additives offer a lot of advantages. But sometimes when we put them in food, we don't realize that one plus one does not equal two in terms of food because food is complicated. For example, carrageenan. Carrageenan in this story is actually a very well accepted food additive that is made from algae, from brown algae. Uh, you can find it in, in processed meats, in processed dairy, and a, a lot of different food products. It's used as a thickener, as a gelling agent, as a stabilizer in many foods. It helps keep, for example, uh, meat products moist and, and juicy. But what we discovered is that when you put it into protein-rich foods, this carrageenan actually binds tightly to proteins and affects our human ability to degrade the proteins. And if you remember from our first act of the story, proteins are extremely important for us nutritionally. And, and if we are now inhibiting, then we're actually introducing what we call an anti-nutritional agent into our food. Why anti-nutritional? Because it actually compromises our ability to enjoy the protein that is in our food. We lose or we diminish our ability to degrade the proteins and we cannot intake the proteins when they are intact. We need to degrade them so our body can uptake whatever it needs. So by introducing this food additive, we can actually compromise the nutritional values of the food. And this is particularly of concern with kids because kids need a lot of protein, their body are growing, they need it. And more than that, they were found to be one of the highest consumers expected consumers for carrageenan containing products. So at the same time, we're getting, giving kids very good foods, very, very high on protein, very, very nutritionally balanced. But if we introduce anti-nutritionals or we don't inactivate them wisely, we might actually be wasting these natural resources for nothing because the, the child's body will not be able to degrade these proteins and, and, and use them and benefit out of it. And this actually tries to bring me to bring me down to our last part of the talk. And this is a burger. So if you're if you just had a burger or thinking of one uh, for dinner, uh, this actually is a burger that could challenge your palate. This is a real burger ser served in IKEA in Copenhagen in Denmark in 2018. This actually uh, Sorry, this burger is actually made from mealworms, so insects. So I don't know if you've thought about insects as, as food for in the Western diet. It actually is part of the diet of 2 billion people on this planet, but most of them eat insects because they are culturally accepted. In the Western world, they are more of a taboo. They are considered to be dirty and, and yuck. Right, so why even consider insects? So why? Here are a few, uh, uh, four par parts of this puzzle. First, they're much more efficient in converting environmental nitrogen into nitrogen or a protein that we consume. For example, a cow needs to get 20 kilograms of feed to produce one kilogram of protein for human consumption. Contrary to that, insects, 
almost have a one-to-one -one conversion ratio, which means that, for example, for crickets, you would need 1.7 kilograms of, of, of feed to get one kilogram of human edible protein. They have higher yields. Insects grow very fast. So they grow in weeks, not in years. We eat most of the insects. So they have more edible parts to, to them. And uh, actually, because we eat almost the entire creature, we get a very high nutritional value out of them. Uh, and we get a lot of protein, we get iron, we get dietary fiber, which is very lacking in most of the Western diets. So why not consider insects? This was one of our, the questions that we asked ourselves. And uh, we started looking into that. We've published several papers, but the one that gives me the ugly side of things is the microbiome or what actually goes down the drain. We as humans contain in our body a lot of, uh, a, a lot of bacteria. Now, these bacteria, we're actually a symbiont. We're actually a, a symbiotic creature that lives with mammalian cells and a lot of bacterial cells that live with us in our body, for example, in our mouth, in our noses, in our ears, in our digestive tract. And this is called the microbiome. And what happens when the microbiome in our gut is exposed to, for example, undigested fractions of insects? So this was part of a recent pub uh, a publication uh, from one of my, uh, the PhD students in my lab. And she actually did an excellent job showing that if people started eating insects, they would get a lot of protein, but they would also get a dietary fiber. Now, this dietary fiber is quite unique. It's called chitin. It's part of the, the, the outer shell or the exoskeleton of many insects. Now, chitin uh, is, quite not, is quite scarce in our diet, but... If people will start eating it, it will become much more prevalent. So she asked herself, if this is an indigestible fraction, this is actually a dietary fiber. Now, will that dietary fiber be good for us or bad for us? And the answer in short, could be very good for us. It could help us diversify our microbiome, which is actually something that has a phenomena that has been associated with weight loss. So it could be very, very good for us to get this chitin up. And why am I telling you this? Why am I so excited to be here? That is because Technion, and not just myself as a researcher, you heard Maya, you'll probably hear more people from Technion talking about it. We've actually flagged the topic of the, the human food ecosystem as something that the Technion would like to tackle from the from the scientific perspective, from the fundamental and from the applied. And this brings us, for example, to the establishment of the, the Carasso Food Tech Innovation Center, where which is under construction and um, expected to open next year and will actually house four different modules. So you see on the bottom screen how it looks in December 2022. And this is hopefully how it will look like in 2024. So we'll have four modules focusing on, on the scale-up because a lot of universities and a lot of different entrepreneurships around the world focus on generating new foods, but you need to scale them up. And this is a bottleneck globally for many of these endeavors. So we're going to tackle this problem of scaling up, producing a lot. Cultured meat is nice, but if you produce only 100 grams per day, this is not enough to feed a family. And if you need to feed several families, you need high throughput, you need scale up. And this is what we're going to do in this Food Tech Innovation Center. And this Innovation Center will also tap into another initiative by Technion, and that is healthy aging. Because food, as, you, as I said, doesn't serve a purpose unless eaten. And this is part of also going to be part of uh, the iTech Age initiative that's going to tackle healthy aging from different perspectives, from the molecular mechanisms that are very fundamental questions of why we age and how do we age and what are the, the mechanisms of aging, all the way down to assistive technologies like nutritional solutions, interventions, personalized medicine for healthy aging. 
all the way up to communities. So even architectural planning, how buildings are designed, these are going to be part of this initiative for healthy aging at the Technion. And just to give you a taste, a last taste, uh, and, and a, uh, if you'd like some dessert, so breakfast cereal. So how about breakfast cereal designed to help elderly people alleviate a lot of the, 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 the adverse effects of aging? So if you think about breakfast cereal, uh, breakfast cereal, commercial breakfast cereal is usually low on protein, very high on sugar, not exactly the best choice nutritionally especially not if this is going to be a major part of the diet. But what we were able to prototype based on, on the knowledge that we've been gaining here in our studies is to generate and to manufacture an alternative product, which is high on protein and high on fat. So it's calorically dense, which is exactly what people need in, in the older age and actually tailored to the palate of, of, of seniors. And we've also done a lot of sensorial evaluations on these products and they're very well accepted and they are now, uh, they were sent to Norway to be clinically tested uh, for their efficacy in uh, affecting a lot of the blood markers for, for example, inflammatory uh, issues and cholesterol levels, et cetera, in the blood. So to wrap up, uh, so quality of life, quality of life, quality of life. Um, if you look into history, we've now uh, we're now increasing uh, the quantity of life. So, right, longevity is increasing worldwide. Even in Israel, uh, the the average Israeli is expected to to surpass the, the age of eighty, but it, it won't be meaningful unless it's with good quality. And quality comes with balanced diets with good physical activity and good mental health. And this is going to be part of what we will do here at the Technion, going to tackle all of these things all across the board and trying to offer diverse solutions that are also sustainable so that we can inherit them to our kids and to our grandkids and pass them on for generations to come. Because it's not just about what's going to be in our food and what's going to be in our environment as well. Because today we seek quality of life um, and technology is going to be detrimental. And if we need technology to get it done, we need people that try to decipher nature so that we can ha harness these insights to actually master what we do. And this obviously brings me to the final conclusion and that is all of the things that I just told you uh, was thanks to these very, very dedicated young professionals. Uh, I, I've been blessed, and, and, and this is one of the reasons why I gladly came, took the offer to come back to the Technion. Excellent students, excellent staff, excellent people doing excellent science. So excellence is in, in, in everything. And as you can see, I share my, uh, we share our passion for food. Uh, and we have a wide network of, of collaborators and, and funding agencies that we always need to acknowledge because all of these curiosities that I've been telling you about our projects, our PhDs, long years of work, a lot of frustrations along the way, um, but we're, we keep moving forward. And this is exactly why uh, I'm excited to share these things with you uh, and hopefully, uh, I was able to uh, build up your appetite for some science and for uh, for some interesting projects. So uh, with that said, I'll stop sharing my screen and open the questions, for questions please if you have. Feel free. Um, I think the most important question is how much of the food did you cook yourself and how much did you buy in that uh, picture? Uh, how much did you create actually, in the lab? This was actually one of our uh, joint activities. Uh, we try to, par to practice uh, as much as possible combinations because uh, we are part of the 4 to 7% of humanity that actually works with food, right? We don't just consume it, uh, but we, we also enjoy consuming it. And that's why we also cook together and, and every get together, we, 
we try to find the uh, good settings, whether for wine tasting, uh, a good barbecue, or just uh, good cooking lessons, like you see in front of you, like you saw in front of you on the screen. It's a in careful your predictions. So, in your Gosh, predictions, it's always, it's always yeah. a matter of balance. Right. Well, balance. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, when do you think this will be commercialized? Like in your opinion or in your predictions, when can we actually see some of the it things? It depends. That... It depends because uh, food innovation is uh, already commercialized in some aspects. Here in Israel, uh, we had uh, three months ago a non animal milk approved. Uh, what does that correct. mean? So cow's milk, but without a cow. Okay. With okay. all the proprietary, with all the properties so of the... A cheese. The... In this case, it's going to be a cheese, uh, like Philadelphia cream cheese, like any cream cheese uh, that you might know. So uh, this is a, an Israeli company called Remilk. They got approved yeah. for marketing in Israel. So and some of these I... innovations are already here. And some of them are much longer in time. For example, the cultured meat is now about to hit markets, but they're going to hit markets with their low grade uh, or, or low grade value products. So not 100% cultured meat, but 10% cultured meat, 90% a carrier, which is nutritionally good. So these are going to be the first products coming into line. Uh, and the, the future for, for these things, uh, you know, only the human imagination can can foresee what what will come of it. But some of, some of these innovations they're already here. Uh, insect meatballs and insect burgers are already sold in Germany and Switzerland. You can get in the U.S. and I think also in Australia you can get snacks that are made with insects, with crickets and and grasshoppers, uh, etc. You can get them. Tim Tim Tam, by the way, there is a kosher version without the insects and there's a non-kosher version wait yeah, so, they use it actually for the um, use it for the coloring yeah so you you have all of these things they're already here now my main concern as a researcher and and, and lucky for me a lot of my colleagues here at the technion as well is that it that we need to extend our, our responsibility beyond getting the food done beyond getting a product. We also need to understand that food is a medicine, is a medicine that we take every day. And we need to address it that way. We need to understand that, as I said, food doesn't serve a purpose unless eaten, right? So this is part of our efforts, trying to harness, you know, AI to think of, of okay, what are we missing out and, and trying to use big data to figure out what's going to be more precise what can we precise more in our nutrition? So precision nutrition comes to mind and all of these things, so not surprisingly actually, uh, exist in this form or, or the other at the Technion uh, with different researchers. Now it's basically just joining hands and pulling in efforts in that direction. Okay, thank you very much, Adi. If, if there's no other questions. I would like to ask what? a question. Ken. Yes, Moa. Hello, I'm Erev Tov. Oh, you're so happy. It's a beser that I'll be Brit. I'm not sure everybody understands. That, uh, yeah, maybe not future. everyone understands Hebrew. I wanted to ask, um, how uh, open-minded is the Israeli population to to I don't know insect-based food? To your opinion. Oh. Insects, insects are a big challenge here in Israel because uh, they have a double, double jeopardy. First of all, the yak factor, and second of all, the kosher factor. So these are two questions that immediately raise browsers here in Israel. Uh, it depends mostly, uh, and you see it with all innovations, the more educated and more in, well-informed people are, the less afraid they are from innovation and the more receptive they are. Uh, I can definitely tell you that uh, we ran, we, we developed here an ice cream that's fortified with uh, insect protein. Uh, and we've had tastings. And psychologically, here with Israelis, 
uh, we were able to demonstrate that it doesn't really matter if it's an insect or just labeled as protein fortified, which was actually quite surprising to us uh, because Israelis just gave it a thumbs up because at the end of the day, we are uh, we interact emotionally with food. So if the food feels right, if it's tasty, if it's pleasurable, you don't really uh, you don't really fight the, the the concept of what it is. Think about a steak. When people eat a burger, they don't really think of the cow, right? Yeah. That's part of, of of also the good thing of the industry that it has distance. It has it's distancing us from the actual foods. That's that it has pros and cons, obviously. But if you think about it, for example, uh, all the vegan and vegetarian uh, uh, sort of uh, diets, they have their benefits also ethically that uh, that you don't need that animals. But, uh, you know, evolution, we evolved eating animals. So perhaps we're putting the horse in front of the carriage uh, in that sense. So people are, are, a lot ask me, what's the right diet? And I, I, I answer, my answer is flexitarian. <laughs> Which uh, is? Flexitarian, <laughs> if you Google flexitarian diets, a flexitarian diet is basically... Uh, reducing your consumption of animals, but not to a zero. Okay, that's interesting. So that because, means flexing. because just to give you two examples, uh, iron bioavailability in animal sources is higher than plant-based. So to get the same amount of iron from plants, you would have to eat much more plants. So environmentally, it's more more it's more expensive to get iron from plants than from animals. That's one example for the benefits of animals. Second benefit for for uh, for animals uh, is, uh, for example, the bioaccessibility of proteins. A lot of the proteins are, are more accessible in animals than in uh, plants, and that is because plants also carry a lot of antioxidants that interfere with digestion. So, eating less animals is proving to be much more much healthier, much more, much wiser uh, in, in that sense, because it's more diverse as well. And that's the biggest advantage. Because even if you go completely, completely vegetarian, you will probably focus on, on very specific foods. That's human nature. And many studies show that, that we stick to, to what we like. So the question is to challenge ourselves. And flexitarians actually challenge themselves almost daily because every day they eat something else so one day it's fish one day it's poultry one day it's tofu another day is tempeh uh, the, the the following day could be a piece of steak or a burger so it's a matter of balancing and that that's my challenge as a scientist trying to find these balances what, what's the right amount hey, one, did I, did I, I try to confuse you enough no, 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 no. It, it, it was, uh, it made sense. And it's, it's, you know, I learned something new. Yeah. Hey, Ru, this is a lot here. I'm, I'm here with Moran. Uh, I've got a question as well. Uh, first, yeah. uh, thank you for, for, for your talk. It's very insightful. Um, and second, it's like, you know, when you're talking about kind of, you know, probably 20 years in the future, you're talking about kind of most of our food going to be manufactured, you know, in, in, in labs and kind of, you know, production lines. And probably it's like gonna come less from animals. And then it, it worries me because you know, um, we're looking at what happened with the uh Materna? baby powder, Materna? you know, products. So they forgot to add something, and then eventually yeah. it, it we reliant on that. Yeah. So you know, with with a steak, it's like no one messed we with share the the same concern. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so any concern. any regulations, any you know, any processes, QA processes that will come um to protect us. So in, in that sense, uh, regulatory, uh, I, I'm involved uh, here in Israel with the Ministry of Health uh, with certain discussions along these lines, because when you look down into the future, just like you said, we're going to change the human diet and we need to realize, first of all, is it a wise change? Second of all, are we making the change reversible? So if we down the line decide to stop, 
or to to divert that we're it's not too late and and, and so until today, a lot of the concerns around food have been mostly dedicated to safety. So just like in medicine, do no harm. So showing that these innovative foods do not cause any adverse effects, they don't pose a risk, but there is a big difference between not posing a risk to offering benefits. Mm -hmm. And this is a gap that I think more and more uh, groups around the world are starting to realize, including regulatory bodies like EFSA, like the FDA, discussing the fact that these future foods will also need to be nourishing, not just uh, pleasurable in that sense. So you don't need to eat a burger and enjoy the burger. You also need to get something out of that burger. And my best example is, a glass of milk and an alternative drink to milk. They don't have the same nutritional value. So uh, here in Israel, you have soy milk. A lot of people think that if they use soy milk, it's the same as, as regular milk or cow's milk or, or goat milk. And nutritionally, it's simply wrong. They don't have the same components. They don't have the same value. And this is particularly worrying, like you said, with infants, for example, if you go to infant formula or you go with kids and you offer them a lot of a, a lot of alternative dairy instead of real dairy, and you think that you're giving them the same nutritional values, then perhaps you're not getting it fully right. So this should be very, very carefully done. And this is my part as a scientist is to bring up questions. So I thank you for that question because this is a question that worries me and I try to answer it with some of uh, my colleagues. And, and for thank example, you, in IKEA um, today, um, sorry, you, you go ahead. Elad, I just promised Uri that it will be short and we're out of time. Don't worry, so don't worry. You, I, I know okay, and uh, I still okay. have time. When I'm when okay, I'm go for it, Elad. Time, you know, sure. So Elad, yeah. if you have so go another for it, question, Elad. feel free. Yeah, so today in, in, in IKEA, for example, it's like um, Germany, you mentioned, it's like, are there any regulations okay, or to, to kind of to supervise, you know, the manufacturers? That's one of the biggest problems, actually, because regulations in terms of commercial manufacturing of food is uh, ex increasing exponentially. And that actually is now starting to limit or to actually challenge the food industry because now they have to do so many tests and so many controls and that producing the foods is becoming less and less profitable. And let's be honest, why should somebody get out of bed, go to work and produce foods for you unless there's something in it for them, right? It doesn't have to be billions of dollars but something out of it. They don't do it for pro bono, right? The food mm. industry has to maintain itself. So regulations need to be very carefully balanced, not to become an obstacle for production, but rather to support safe production, to support nutritious production. Cool. Okay? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating today. Uh, we have another webinar coming next week with Professor Avi Spiegelman. We will discuss the processing food for and of So thank you all for those last questions because it was a good uh, can do it for next week. I, if you don't know, we are, as uh, Professor Lesmus mentioned, we are building a new Car the Carasso Center. There is still room to, do uh, to donate for the two foyers. Uh, if you're interested in that, contact me for that as well. And again, thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop recording now.